Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you. We come to you today, Lord Father, giving you honor and glory. We thank you, Lord Father, for all that you have done for us, Lord Father, for all your plans that you have for us. Lord Father, we thank you, Lord God, for giving us this day, allowing us to see this morning. We thank you, Lord Father God, for allowing us to have breath in our body, the use of our limbs, having clarity and sound mind, having a heart, Lord God, that is at peace, having a soul, Lord Father God, that believes in you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Father God, for this morning that you've given us our being. You have allowed us, Lord Father God, to make a choice, a choice for you, Lord, and we thank you. Thank you for the choice for you. And, Lord Father, for the love that you've given us, Lord God, for the grace and mercy that you bestowed upon us, that the blessings, Lord God, that you poured out upon us, Lord Father God. Lord Father, we thank you. Thank you, Lord God. You are mighty and awesome. And, Father, we thank you for the word, Lord God, that's going to come forth today. Let it be nourishment, Lord Father, encouragement, Lord God. Lord Father, let it be the education that we need, Lord God, for today's application, for the practical application in our lives, Lord Father. And Lord Father, we thank you, God. Thank you, God, for allowing us to have a willing heart, mind and soul and spirit, Lord Father to partake of the word, to partake of your meal. Yes. And Lord Father, we thank you. And Lord, as the word comes forth, Lord Father, bless the woman of God that had given the word. Lord Father, you, Lord Father, strengthen, uphold her, Lord God. Continue to use her, Lord Father, in great and magnificent ways, Lord God. Lord Father, let there be performances, Lord Father, of things greater, Lord God, than even our imagination or expectation, God. Let it die to herself that you arise in her. Let your glory shine through her, Lord Father, in the name of Jesus. Let it encompass, Lord Father, all that she does. Let everything about her be better than blessed, Lord God. Greater, Lord Father, in her are you, Lord God. And Lord Father, we bless your name. We honor you. Bless the intercessors that are on this line, those that are coming on the line, Lord Father. Those, Lord Father, God, that will listen to the recording. Those, Lord Father, that will hear about it, Lord God, as the message will be shared with someone else, Lord Father. Lord God, you continue to bless, keep, and guide, strengthen, instruct, Lord God. Allow, Lord Father, the ears of the intercessor to be acute and sharp, Lord God, as well as the vision. Let the eyes, Lord God, see great distance, Lord Father. Help us, Lord Father, to be diligent in our prayer life. Help us to be diligent, Lord Father, in communing with you. Help us to be diligent, Lord God, in seeking you, Lord God. Help us, Lord Father, to constantly pray and watch, Lord Father, in the name of Jesus. And, Lord Father, we thank you. We honor you, Lord God. There is none greater, none more magnificent, none mightier. Lord Father, you made the heavens and the firmament. Lord God, you extend from one end to the next. Lord God, you are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, Lord Father. You are our middle, Lord God. You are all in all. Lord Father, we bless your name, God. And we thank you. We honor you, Lord God. There's nothing too hard for you. 
And we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So Lord, strengthen us today to do all that we need for your glory, for your honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Marlise. Good morning, intercessors. We're going to jump straight into the word. It's been a an interesting morning already. God has been just revealing some things, and I'm excited to share what he's been revealing. Amen? Can you just a hint of feedback? Amen. So we've discussed all week about the Lamb of God, and we've talked about the importance of understanding that we're not just talking about the downy white animal just frolicking up rolling through the green meadows and being carried tenderly in the arms of a loving shepherd. But we're talking about the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world. Amen? And when we pray to Jesus as the Lamb of God, we're praying to the one who voluntarily laid down his life to take in his own body the punishment for our sins and for the sins of the entire world. Past, present, and future. Amen. And the focus scripture always long is in John 1, verse 24 through 35. And so I'm going to go right to scripture. Amen. Reading out of Exodus 12, a very familiar story. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the an animal for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some on the doors. Put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway, and he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Now that was Exodus 12, verse 12 and 13, and then verse 21 through 23. Jumping over to Revelation, chapter 5. I'll start at, start at verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center before the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God members of every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a king and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Revelation 5, chapter 6, and then, I'm sorry, verse 6, and then verse 9 through 10. Amen. I want us this morning to praise God. Praise him for purchasing your souls with the currency of his son's death. I want you all to offer thanks today because God himself is our safety. And I want us to take some time this morning and go into our prayer closet and confess any complacency about living our lives 
for Christ. Ask God today to help you approach each day with hope and trust. As you meditate on Exodus 12, verse 12 through 13, and then verse 21 through 23, and Revelations 5, verse 6 through 10. Amen. So I'm going to tell you all a story that <laughs> um, a girlfriend of mine told me a few years back. And every time I think about the story of the blood being placed on the door frames. I think about this story. So it was now over a decade or just a little over a decade or so ago. A girlfriend of mine said that, you know, on a winter night, she woke up because she heard an unmistakable sound of someone creeping stealth-like up the stairs in her house. Or whether her children were too afraid to be lurking around her house in the dark, especially at 2.30 in the morning. She decided the best course of action was to confront whoever was lurking in the shadows. So with her heart racing and her hands trembling, she threw open her bedroom door and jumped out. And at the same time, hit the light switch just outside her bedroom. So she was extremely startled by the boldness of her actions, the intruder froze there in front of her with her six-year-old daughter and her four-year-old daughter, and they were holding hands, creeping up the steps together. She said after some close questioning, it was revealed that they were searching the house for leprechauns and pots of gold, which they assured her could only be found in the middle of the night. Now, I'm going to tell you what she told me. Don't ask her where they got their heads filled with ideas of leprechauns and pots of gold. To this day, she still doesn't know. However, she was shaken by the thought of how defenseless she had felt and how defenseless she really was in reality had that been a real intruder. So needless to say, the next week, she arranged for a security system to be installed in her home. Whatever it cost, the sense of safety would be worth it, right? Now they all could sleep in peace. Now. The book of Exodus talks about another kind of security system, one innocent of codes and wires, alarms, or even warning signs, but one that was far more effective than anything ever devised by human beings. See, the Israelites, they were told to smear the doors of their homes with the blood of the Passover lamb. Any home so marked will be spared God's judgment. The angel of death would pass over, visiting only the homes whose doors remained unmarked. Now, in this last most terrible plague that went through Egypt, the Egyptians would lose their firstborn sons and firstborn animals. And this all was a punishment for resisting God's command to let his people go. But have you ever wondered why did God insist on a visible mark to distinguish between his people and the Egyptians? I mean, if you're like me, you're thinking, I know he could tell the difference. I know he knew which houses his children were sleeping in. And of course he did. But did you listen closely to the words in the scripture. He said it was for a visible sign for them, for the people, not for him. It was a visible sign of God's protection for his people. 
But what does this ancient story have to do with us today? I'm sure some of you are wondering. Last night, um, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was troubled in thinking about how fleeting life really is. You know, it's as if we're on an invisible conveyor belt and we're headed towards death. It's inevitable. And we act as though it's not happening. We respond as if Everything else around us takes precedence over this fact when the truth of the matter is from the day we were born, we were living to die. So while we're on this invisible conveyor belt, we, you know, we steady our minds and we think about everything else. We talk about the things that are going on in the world. We concern ourselves with agendas and to-do lists, and we concern ourselves with everything else. But there's nothing in this world strong enough to halt the advancing on this conveyor belt. Not science, not money, not even love. from the best of us to the worst of us, from the youngest to the oldest. All of us are heading towards death. But instead of us scrambling to get off this conveyor belt, this assembly line that's heading that way, we just accept it and try to, I guess, put it in the back of our minds. Because we know there's not much that we can do to stop it. But if you think about it, all the time that we spend chatting and laughing, planning and scheming, working and to make a better life as though we're all going to live forever. But I begin to think of all the things that had preoccupied me over the past week. You know how some of them seem so crucial, so important, so vital. And now they seem so trivial, even ridiculous, in light of our inevitable future, right? And I'm sure you're wondering, like, what does such gloomy thoughts have to do with our discussion currently about security? and safety. Think of it like this. What if the Exodus story tells us something about our own future? What if it points out another Passover lamb? Jesus of Nazareth, who was himself killed shortly after celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples, right? So what if it his blood that marks us and sets us apart as God's people so that when the angel of death passes over us at the final judgment, we will experience not death eternal, but eternal life. So instead of belonging to Jesus, the Lamb of God, being our focus, we try to focus on all the other stuff in the world. I think it will help us to have a more heaven per heavenly perspective if we were to keep that in the forefront of our mind. Because he is the only security system 
capable of preserving us from death, right? He's the only one more powerful enough to get us off this assembly line or this conveyor belt that would otherwise lead to our destruction. Because of death, because of his death, we can live forever in perfect peace and joy. And so that is the hope that we share, right? Believing as we do that because Jesus lives in us, the Father will one day raise us up with him to a place that is eternally secure. So I challenge you all to take a moment. Close your eyes and lift your heart to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Imagine him slain for you. Now picture him alive again and standing next to God's throne in heaven, making forever intercessions for you. What do you see? What does he, does he say to you? How do you respond? You see, I ask these questions because so many times we lose focus and track of what's important. But I want us to understand that we have to approach this assembly line, this conveyor belt of reality with a different perspective and a childlike heart. Because those two little girls who were searching in the middle of the night forgot about or pushed aside their fears in hopes that they would find something that would bless not just themselves, but their family. We found a Savior who will not only save us, but all of those who believe on him. And with childlike faith, we're going to trust him. We are to go to him, confide in him, attempt to be more like him. Amen? And so the Lord started speaking to me even the more about having a childlike heart. He took me over to Mark 10. Verse 15 says, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Sounds simple enough, right? You know, I recently uh, read a story of a young family who went out to eat at a local restaurant. They were the only family in the restaurant that had, you know, children eating with them. And so the mom sat there, little boy, and I want to say his name is Eric, in a high chair. And Notice that everyone was quietly sitting and talking. Suddenly, Eric squeals with glee and says, hi. And he pounded his little fat baby hands on the high chair's top. His eyes were crinkly and laughter, and his mouth bore this toothless grin as he wriggled and giggled with joy. So the mother looked around and saw the source of his merriment. It was a man who was wearing baggy pants and his shoes were so worn that his toes poked out. His shirt was dirty and his hair was uncombed and unwashed. His whiskers were too short to be called a beard and his nose was so very close that it looked like a road map. The man sat far away but the mother was sure he smelled bad. 
his hands waved and slapped on loose wrists as in an effort to make Eric laugh even louder. Hi there, baby. Hi there, big boy. I see you, Buster. The man said to Eric. And Eric's mom and dad exchanged a look and asked, what do we do? Eric continued to laugh and answer, hi, hi. By now, everyone in the restaurant noticed the man who was creating a nuisance with this beautiful baby. Their meal came and the man began shouting across the room, do you patty cake? Do you know peekaboo? Hey, look, he knows peekaboo. Nobody thought the old man was cute. And some even thought he was obviously drunk. Eric's parents were embarrassed and they ate in silence. But not Eric. He was running through his repertoire for his admiring new friend who appeared to be a skid row bomb, who in turn reciprocated with his cute comment. The parents finally got through with their meal and headed for the door. The husband went to pay for the check and gave his wife the keys and said, I'll meet you in the parking lot. The old man had poised himself between the mother's position and the front door. All she could think was, Lord, just let me out of here before he speaks to me or Eric. As she drew closer to the man, she continued, and she even turned Eric's back to try to sidestep him, to avoid breathing the same air as she did. Eric leaned over her arm, reached with both arms in that famous baby pick-me-up motion. As she did, uh, as the mother tried to control her man, Eric literally pushed off his mother with his leg and did a leap of faith into the arms of his newfound friend. Suddenly, this very old smelly man and a very young baby consummated their love and kinship. Eric, in the act of total trust, love, and submission, laid his tiny head on the man's ragged shoulder. The man's eyes closed and tears hovered beneath his lashes. His aged hands, full of grime, pain, and hard labor, cradled the baby, and gently stroked his back. No two beings had ever loved so deeply for so short a time. The mother and every other person in that restaurant were awestruck. The old man rocked and cradled Eric in his arms and his eyes opened, and in a firm and even commanding voice, he said, you take care of this baby. Somehow the mother managed. I will, from a throat that was choked with emotion. He pried Eric from his chest, lovingly and longingly, as though he were in pain. The mom took her baby and the man said, God bless you, ma'am. You've given me my Christmas gift. With Eric securely in her arms, the mother nodded wiped away a tear, and ran for the car. When the husband made it to the vehicle, he was wondering why his wife was crying and holding Eric so tightly, saying, my God, my God, forgive me. Everyone had just witnessed Christ's love shown through an innocent of a tiny child who saw no sin, who made no judgment, a child who saw a soul and the mother who saw a suit of clothes. The mother was a Christian who was blind. She was holding a child who was not. A ragged old man had unwittingly preached the message found in Scripture. To enter the kingdom of God, 
We must become as little children. You see, sometimes we have to throw off our cloaks of judgment and forego trying to presume who or what a person is. I challenge you all to read the story of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, verse 25 through 37. Put yourself in the place of the wounded man. Remember, he was beaten and robbed and left on the road for dead. And a priest of the gospel, a Levite, crossed to the other side of the road to avoid him. A second man did the same. And then the Good Samaritan came and saw this man, remember? And he tended to his wounds. He put him on his horse and he, or his donkey rather, he took him to a hotel. And he nursed the man for a while and paid the innkeeper to keep a watch over the man and to attend to him until he could get back. And when he came back, he said, if I owe you anything, I'll pay you when I return. And when the Good Samaritan returned, he did, exactly as he said. How would you respond to the actions of someone like the Good Samaritan? If you put yourself in the place of the Good Samaritan, what would you have been thinking when you saw the wounded Jewish man lying on the road? Put yourself in the place of the innkeeper. What do you imagine he thought when the Samaritan brought this wounded Jewish man into his establishment? And how does this story apply to your life? The same as the Skid Row bomb applied to the mother and the young child's life. You see, it's so easy for us to leave each day with tunnel vision, to dismiss people because they don't look like what we do or they don't act like we do. Jesus never did that. He always made time for the lonely man, woman, or child in need. Don't we want to be more like him? I know I want to have eyes that see past the outer shell to the soul. I want to have his heart when it comes to meeting the needs of people he brings into our lives or to my life. How about you? Meditate on it for just a moment as I close this out in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord God. I thank you for meeting us here this morning, for speaking into our lives, Lord God, for Allow this time for us to hear you minister to our hearts and our minds. Father, forgive us for the times that we judge others and fail to love them like you wanted us to love them. Help us to see others through your eyes of unconditional love. Give us the heart to love and mercy shown towards others in need. Help us to have our words seasoned with grace that we'll be able to speak to them in love, that they'll be able to receive what is being spoken. We thank you, Christ, for being the Lamb of God, the one who is willing to be slain for our sin. We thank you for purchasing and paying a price, purchasing us and paying a price that 
we could have never paid. Clearing a debt from over our heads that we would have never been able to take care of. Thank you for giving us eternal life and life more abundantly. Thank you for giving us clear instructions and examples of your character, your way. Help us to be more like you, to live like you, to love like you, to forgive like you, to show grace like you, to have a heart that forgives and love unconditionally. Help us, Lord, to apply these things to our lives and share it with others that you will be glorified and magnified in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts? Did God bless you? Did he speak to you? Did he minister to your heart? This is our time in a second.